has, has been in Kaitu. Okay? But I'm going to focus today, I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb and tell you about some new results exclusively on CHI-3 results, since I think the focus of interest here is mainly on CHI-3. So I'm going to tell you about some new results, uh, none of which have been really published yet, uh, on CHI-3 processes. Okay? But I'm going to follow Ben's instructions and I'm going to basically avoid almost all equations. There will be basically no equations. So I will be telling you the results of things. Uh, what I'm going to do, therefore, is really focus on nonlinear optics and channels and rings. And I'm going to give you the qualitative physics, or try to highlight some of the qualitative physics, actually just some of the qualitative physics. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a few sort of results that tell you the results of the calculations. It will give you a little bit of a flavor, I, th I hope, of the processes that are going on and the sort of scaling laws and the parameters that control things. Okay? Uh, and I want to talk about, first of all, I'll talk about that classical process I alluded to, uh, four-wave mixing. And then I'll talk about quantum analog, spontaneous four-wave mixing. And I'll wrap up uh, with a summary. Uh, but first, I want to talk about some analogous systems. I'm going to be focusing on rings, but a lot, of the th uh, a lot of the results and the physics I talk about isn't restricted to rings. Um, it, it can, you can see it in other systems, too. For example, you can see it in disk, disk resonators rather than ring resonators. This is a disk resonator from Kerry Valhalla's group. Uh, these are some amazing devices they make that they can couple with the outside world by fibers. It's very hard and it's probably not the kind of scheme that's manufacturable. But they get very, very large cues, up to millions in these structures, and they've been able to move into the, the, the strong coupling regime in quantum optics. Basically, the same equations that govern the ring resonators with a few modifications also govern these structures as well. And let me just mention one other analog. And that is very much like this kind of two-channel ring structure is a photonic crystal structure where you have a channel here cut out. So these are holes, right, in some sort of 2D structure that make it in a photonic crystal. But there's a channel. Some holes are missing here. And then there's a little defect here. And it turns out the equation for how light can you know, come along here, spend some time in this defect, and go back, very analogous to the equations that are used here. Okay, so the, kinds, the kind of way of thinking that I'm going to be talking about, I'll, I'll, you know, give, num I'll give, I'll give expressions for ring structures, but a lot of it carries on to more general structures like this as well. Okay, so here we go. Let's start out, and let's do classical physics first. Let's just talk about how, how this kind of structure could go, uh, this kind of process could go on where I do my little sort of reaction of my photons here. And I want to do this, let's imagine, in a channel waveguide. Okay? So here's a few equations for some of you who are sort of uh, conversant with these things. So this is a chi 3 process. And what happens is I'm mixing two fields at omega p, my pump, okay, with the complex conjugate of a field at my signal frequency. And that, if you count up the frequencies here, is going to give me a polarization that's oscillating at this idler frequency, 2 omega p minus omega s. And that polarization can start to radiate light. And, well, here it'll start to radiate light. And if this is a channel waveguide, and, you know, a little bit down the hall here, it's also going to start to radiate light. But we run into a problem here that's very common in all of nonlinear optics, and that is it could be that the light that's generated here isn't in phase with the light that's generated here, and you know, at the end you don't get very much out because you get destructive interference. The condition you need to get everything add to add up is something called phase matching. Here's the condition for this to process. I need twice kp minus ks minus ki to equal zero where these are the wave vectors for the light. So it's the frequency times the index of refraction at that frequency. And well, here's the condition. Now, we have this condition up here. So you can see that if the index of refraction were the same at all these frequencies, this one would guarantee this one. But since in general it's not, they don't. And I don't have this condition, at least not automatically met. And that means I pay a price, OK? So if Let's, let's talk about 
the undepleted pump and signal approximation, I'm going to assume that what I'm talking about is so weak that I can treat the pump and signal here as if they're not being modified and they just carry on. Okay? Well, then if I don't, if I don't have that phase matching you know, set up exactly right, I have a little penalty factor here. If this, if this k difference is equal to zero, then this is equal to one, and the power coming out at the idler frequency, let's say normalized to the cross-sectional area here, is going to be proportional to L squared because all these pieces add up and then I square them to find the power. Okay. So we'll give this phase matching term here, just since, since it's long and ugly, I'll just call it phi squared. Okay, it's a name, name for that term. Now how else are things going to scale here? Well, I've got two pump fields up here, and when I squared, I get four pump fields, so that's a pump intensity squared. So I expect this thing to scale like the pump power uh, squared, let's say, divided by the area again to normalize it out. I have one signal field when I square what the field here to get the power at the idler, I'll get a power in the signal. Okay, so that's, that's I expect this to be proportional to these guys. And what's left, well, you know, sort of dimensions tell you that what's left has to have units of squared power divided by area. That's just to make the dimensions work. It has to have that. Okay? Now when you actually do the theory, you find that that's what that thing is. It has to do with material properties, group velocities, frequencies, and the chi-3. Okay? And the A here, I just thought of as a geometric area, but really this is a kind of effective area if I'm dealing with a channel waveguide that tells me how, how these modes all mix. Okay? So this is the constant that tells me everything I need to know about the material and the structure. I've lumped it all in here. Okay? And you can ask how big that is. Well, for, for few silica, it's 57 megawatts per micron squared. That happens to be the number. Okay? Take your favorite material, silicon, chalcogenide glasses, whatever, put the chi-3 in here, you'll get a number like that. Okay? And that will tell you how well this process is going to work okay? in the limit where I have an undepleted pump and undepleted signal. Okay. How can a ring help? Okay, that's just a channel. What is a ring going to do? Well, we get an enhancement of intensity in the ring. And the way that's usually described in this is a simple model where one says, if I have a field of amplitude 1 coming along here, there's a fraction, an, a, an amplitude sigma goes forward, and an amplitude kappa goes into the ring. Okay, these are field amplitudes. And how big sigma and kappa is, well, that's determined by, you know, how good the coupling is between the channel and the ring. And what you then get because of that is, is an enhancement in the intensity in the ring. It's a function of frequency. I'm thinking now CW. And, you know, it's, uh, when I hit one of these resonances, it goes up to a large number, far, far in excess of one. Okay? Omega-1 here is the lowest ring frequency. That's when I have just one wavelength in here. But typically in the, in the optical regime, one has 50 or 100 for typical rings resonances here. So the index M is 50 or 100. And you get these resonances when you get up, up to that point. The alpha squared here, um, which gives you the enhancement of the intensity of the ring, can easily be factors of 100 or 2. Okay? In structures people have made in gallium arsenide, the numbers are around 100, 200. There's no reason they couldn't be much larger. Okay. okay. Here's what we had in the channel. Okay. Now let's look at the same kind of physics, but going on in a ring. Okay. What happens? Well, much of it is the same. Okay. The, the length that's involved here, I'm going to assume, since the intensity is going to be very strong in the ring and not in the channel, I'm going to assume all the nonlinear processes go on in.